Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irene. I'm the host here. My guest today is uh, Faith Humphrey Hill. Hi, Faith. Hi. So I saw you on Instagram and it stopped me in my tracks because I have never seen anything like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tell me how it all started because like you're an artist, you're obviously a very talented artist. You can you started with like pencil and you know paper and sketching and all of that. How did it become knitting project? Yeah. So yeah, I was always uh, an artist painting and drawing. I went to art school um, and really focused on painting and drawing, working a lot in charcoal and oil paints, and then working from life. So a lot of figure modeling and stuff like that. And uh, while I was a student, I was also running the student galleries. So I would show artwork by other students in different departments. And I was showing work by the fiber art students. And they knit a lot. And I was like, this is so cool. Like just watching them knit just looks so magical to me because yeah, I didn't have family members who knit, um, so I wasn't exposed to it really like then. It was more like when I was art school and watching what the fiber art students were doing. So that's when it sort of entered my sort of list that at some point I wanted to learn how to knit. Um, just looked great. So many, many, many years later, <laughs> I had my son and I was a full time mom with him and I was struggling to find ways to incorporate my drawing and my oil painting into my new lifestyle, watching a young child. Um, those are really messy mediums and they can get all over your hands and then I'd have to take care of the little kid and it was too much. So I thought, you know, I've always wanted to learn how to knit. So I'm gonna teach myself how to knit. And that was 17 years ago now. And so that was before YouTube. <laughs> Um, before there were some local yarn shops that are now around me. So I learned from books on how to knit. And then I just can, like was always knitting. So I always had a knitting project going, you know, hats, scarves, socks, sweaters, that sort of thing. Um, and then I always was sketching and drawing once my schedule freed up and allowed it. So I was kind of doing the both, both things. Um, then about eight years ago, I became a full-time artist. Um, before that, I was working in the arts and galleries and museums and such. And I was exhibiting my artwork and I was exhibiting my drawn portraits. So I was doing lots of crosshatch portraits like I do now uh, before the knitting gets involved. Um, so I was exhibiting those and I was walking around knitting my socks because that's just what I do. <laughs> and <laughs> the visitors would come up to me and they would be like, you know, they would talk about the artwork, but then they would be like, oh, you're knitting. Oh, and they would like tell me all these stories about what knitting means to them and their history with knitting or their experience with knitting. And I went back to the studio the next day and, you know, sort of thinking about how the night went and, you know, the reception I got from all the, the people and visitors who stopped by. And I was thinking about their reaction to knitting and just how people's eyes lit up with knitting and how there was this really like, accessibility to it um and all their stories were you know had words like warmth and comfort and hug and all these really like pleasant cozy like thoughts and you know I started thinking about what knitting meant to me and my experience with knitting and thinking about how like how many things I own are knit and how accessible those items are like socks are knit, you know, hats are knit. My babies were born and that was the first textile they put on them was a knit hat, you know, like that's that ingrained in our world that it's, it's that involved. And so that's when I started thinking like, you know, I really want that, those words and those ideas and those concepts connected to the faces that I'm drawing. And so that's when I went out and I was trying to come up with ways to merge together knitting with drawing. Well, but okay, so one second. So there is this uh, antique, uh, not antique, but vintage uh, knitting yeah. machine that got involved that some somebody somehow hacked. <laughs> Tell me about that story. Yes. So, um, you know, I initially started doing like an underpainting for my knit portraits by hand. So then I was doing some backwards knitting and some intarsia mixed with stranded knitting and kind of merging all these techniques to make them by hand. But it was very time consuming, of course, and um, the stitches would pull a little bit, which was fine for me for the artwork because the whole 
you know, it kind of added a lot of personality and made it obvious it was handmade and all of that and that it was knitting. And so I was okay with it, but I really wanted to start merging this into knit animations where I could take, you know, if I can make one image, I could make 20 and put them together and make a moving image. And so I wanted to work into that. So I had this old knitting machine. Um, it was built, it's a brother KH551. And I had had it with me for several years, um, but I knew it would speed up the process. So um, I sat down for a week and taught myself how to use it. I made a sweater. Um, then I was like, okay, now I know how to use it like the normal way. <laughs> now I have to figure out how to use it to mix between between four to eight colors of yarn and how to do these really complex images. That about the first project that you created on that machine and how that was going the the sweater or some of the first portraits the first portrait the first portrait so um I'm trying to remember the first one that I made on it I think it went fine I think it went pretty successfully I had known from working on these similar images by hand because what I do I'll back up a little so what I do is I'll work digitally and I create a drawing and I work digitally so that I can break it up into layers. So one layer is what I call like an underpainting and it's just kind of this mess of color. And that's what I export and turn into a knitting pattern. And so that's what I'm knitting from. So it's coming straight from my original drawing. And so when I'm working by hand, I would work with little bobbins with all my different colors and I would have the chart where I could see which color was which stitch. And I would, you know, that's the color I would work with. And so I would do backwards knitting. So I could just go back and forth, back and forth. And I would, you know, just pick up the color that I needed. Um, so I saw, sort of followed a similar technique when working with that knitting machine is I would hold, I learned how to set it for intarsia on that machine. And then I would pick up the bobbin with the color that I needed and then move the carriage back and forth um, to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I watched you on Instagram doing just that. And, you know, when we talk about knitting, right, we're thinking about this, somebody sitting in a very comfy chair and like knitting. That's not what's happening with you. It's like complete workout. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. So my knitting machine is right here that I'm using now. So um, I've since gotten more knitting machines. And so I have one behind me here that's made in the 70s. This one is my hacked one that was made in the 80s. And you can see that it's up at a standing desk. So when I use it, I'm standing and it's a full, my whole body is moving. And yeah, I, I love these machines. I love that they're so interactive. Um, you know, I, I know people probably hear machine and think, oh, it's doing all the work for you. But like, no, <laughs> these are these are old machines and they're quirky. And they have personality. And if you just pull the carriage ever so slightly the wrong way, 
it's going to drop your stitches. So they're very mechanical and you have to kind of learn their flow. You know, this one uh, from the seventies, I was using it the other day and I was like, right with this machine, I have to push the carriage back a little bit and not push down too hard because that's just what that like that machine likes, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's really, but I love tinkering with machines. And so, yeah, it's definitely a passion of mine. Well, when you need nowadays hand me, right? Does it feel weird? No. No, no, I love hand knitting too. I have a couple projects that are, you know, in the works. I have a shawl and always socks, always have socks on the needles that I take with me. Well, do you feel like you treat the portraits as work and socks as hobby? Is there a separation? No, because I'm also a sample knitter. So um, a sample knitter is different than a test knitter. So as a sample knitter, um, companies and publications will hire me to hand knit their pattern um, and they'll send me the yarn and everything. So I do a lot of professional hand knitting for them as well. Um, so yeah. When you pick up a project for yourself, when it's not a portrait, how do you go about it? Like what attracts you? Oh, for a knitting project? Okay, yeah, if it's not a sample job and it's not uh, artwork. Um, I like to choose projects that I'm going to learn a little something from. It's so that's still something for you to learn because like I'm hearing all this like intarsia and this and that. Like, is there still something for you to learn out there for knitting? Always. <laughs> Isn't that what's so beautiful about knitting is there are just so many things to learn. There's so many yarns I haven't used, so many patterns, so many combinations I haven't done you know I mean do you feel like I mean I, I'm just like I'm looking at the portraits right and I'm looking at your drawing portraits and I'm thinking this is it it's done then you're going and you're putting it on the knitting machine this is like an extra step is it hard to price your projects because as an artist you don't price by the hour when it's when it's knitting it's sort of this combination of craft and art right is yeah it, is it harder to price um, no, I haven't found it to be too difficult to price the work. Um, you know, it's just, once you start moving your artwork and selling it and exhibiting it, you just sort of find where you fall in the niche of art and it works itself out. So what size portrait does it become at the end? Oh, it varies. So the ones that you might see, I have several series of knit portraits that I do. So the knit prints are what I started with. And those are the ones that actually exist digitally. And those are the ones where I knitted them on that original machine, photographed them and layered them back under the crosshatch. So those are the knit print series. Um, and so those are usually knit like 10 inches. So not super big. Um, then I have my knit arts. You can kind of see one that's which way? That way. Over there, <laughs> you kind of see the bit of one. Um, that one is about 36 inches square, um, but those can range from 10 inches up to like three, four feet. And those are the knit portrait using between four, usually six colors of yarn in it. And then I'll put vinyl over it and I draw on the vinyl. So it has this nice layered effect, sort of deals with time. Um, of course, the knit animations, which are a different story. And then I've started working on what you can see back here. Uh, this piece is six colors of yarn and it's seven feet tall. So I've started working on knit tapestries. And for those, um, I use this nice big computerized hacked machine. How long does it like an average project take you? Like um, The big ones, these huge murals, uh, tapestry pieces, they take me about a month to do. They take a lot of time and I have three sort of hung up there. Uh, the smaller ones, these like four, like up to four feet ones, those take about two weeks. Begin to add. And then the knit prints can take me, you know, a week, a couple days. So I saw two things about you that like really deeply touched me. One was your series of portraits that you did for people who died from COVID. And the second one was that you're doing all these little uh, portraits of pets that are waiting for adoption at your local pet shelter. Yeah. Tell me more about both of those series. 
Yeah. So, um, so the portraits of COVID, I did that as an artist in residence at the Harold Washington Library downtown Chicago. So that's our big main Chicago based library. So they have a maker lab there. So I was invited to be an artist in residence. I was able to work there and uh, they have two knitting machines in their maker lab that have been hacked. So I was able to tune them up and get them back up and running and use them to create these portraits. Um, yeah, I just really wanted to honor the people and remember the folks who had passed away. And it was a really, it was a unique experience because, you know, every day I would work at the library at their knitting machines. And my I was stationed sort of right outside the Maker Lab doors because COVID was still very much so happening. So mm -hmm. the Maker Lab was locked up and closed. It was by appointment only. Um, but I was sort of out in the public just a little bit, just outside the doors working. And I'd see all these people and talk to them about the knitting machines and what I was working on. Um, and, you know, and then I'm thinking like, I'm making a portrait of somebody who will never be someone who will randomly walk past me here, you know, because, I often will think, you know, oh, what if I meet the person I'm drawing? Because most of them are strangers to me, which I like. But, um, and sometimes I wonder like, oh, what if I bump into them? That'll be so weird because I have this whole relationship that I've developed with this face. I've studied them. I've spent time with them. I've like, I when I draw a face, I, I mirror them a little. So I kind of find this commonality between us. And um, so, yeah, that was really a unique aspect of that experience was thinking like, wow, I will never just accidentally bump into this person wandering around the city here and working in the library, which is a very big public space. Um, it was also unique in that I got to meet some of the family members and give them the artwork that I had created. Um, so that was really interesting and, and hearing their stories about the person and how similar it was to what I had observed by studying their face. So it was really a beautiful experience to do that. The um, animals that I draw, um, I like, I'm a big fan of pet adoption. I have three adopted dogs that are on the floor right next to me <laughs> right now. Um, they hang out in the studio with me all day. And so I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for pet adoption. And, you know, when I draw animals, I love to look for, you know, who who do I want to raise up, right? Like, who do I want to draw a portrait of who do I want to spend time with who do I want to get to know and and share with others and so I want to share and advocate for you know pets that need homes and working with the animal care league which is my local animal shelter um because I've collaborated collaborated with them quite a bit um they gave me a list of animals who were long-term stays they had been in the shelter for a really long time for different reasons either they were a little older or they had, they were bonded. It was a bonded pair situation. Not a lot of people were willing to take in two animals at a time. So those kinds of things. So I wanted to really highlight those animals. Um, and then when the pets get adopted and they have some of them, so that was awesome. Um, they're able to take a piece of artwork home with them. That's so amazing. Do you, do you have um, a favorite portrait that you created? Like, is there something that you would like always keep for yourself? Um, let's see. I mean, they're all very special to me because like I said, I spend time with these people, these faces, and I find, you know, our common ground. Um, there are a couple of pieces that have been in my studio for a long time. And so as I, you know, transition between series or like, you know, all the things of the pandemic, you know, that face was always there. So now I've sort of become very connected with that and like in a totally different way because it's always been with me through some really weird times. When you look at your earlier work and compare it with what you do right now, like do you see how much you grew? Do you see mistakes? Like how do you look at those portraits? Um, before I started becoming a full-time artist, when I was working in more traditional media, because when I became a full-time artist, that's when I started working with digital tools more. And, and so back when I was working in oil paints and charcoal, you know, I look back at those pieces and I'm like, oh, they're just so timid. Like I was so afraid of color because, you know, you spend all this time getting a rendering really nice. And then I would get nervous about like messing it up or, you know, having to throw it away or, you know anything like that. So I wasn't taking as many risks as digital allowed me to do. And 
digital allowed me to be portable, which was a big deal. So that allowed me, to, it was so much easier and it's clean. So like if I had those tools when my son was little, you know, I would have been doing more drawing at that time and said, I only did knitting during that time, which was fun. And I'm happy I did, but it would have been nice if I could have the balance that I have now where I can do both of them at the same time. Um, so yeah, those are the big differences that I see when I sort of reflect back at the art that I used to make. So you mentioned that you have the special relationship with the faces that you portray. How do you pick those faces? I find the faces on uh, an artist to artist network. So unless of course it's a special project like the ones you had mentioned earlier, most of my pieces are coming from an app called Sketchy or Museum by Sketchy. And it's an artist to artist network and we share little reference photos and snapshots that we've taken that other artists are welcome to use in their artwork. And so it's, and it's an international platform. There are tons of people from all over the world posting pictures and they're not just portraits they have animals as well and they have places and still lives and such um, but I really love drawing portraits they're my favorite and it's so cool because I don't know these people so as I was mentioning the difference of when I knew a little bit of something about them in this case in most cases I don't know anything about them and it's been really interesting working through that because as an artist because we're typically drawing a portrait of somebody like we get the history of who they are and you know when I did figure drawing a lot you know the model would come into the studio and you knew first of all they live nearby you knew their name you knew like you know they'd be like oh traffic oh and then you know like okay their day was bad you know um you'd have all this background information that was feeding your artwork and I think it just feels very like true and genuine that I don't have any of that background information all I have is what my eyes observe and I'm a visual learner. It's how I understand and take in the world. So it feels very direct to me. It feels very like, yep, like I will study them. I will get to know them by looking at them and observing them and noticing the details of their face and, you know, how their hair falls or what colors they're wearing or like, you know, little like creases around their mouth, you know, like all those little details tell a story about who they are. Um, and I love sort of getting to know them fresh and clean like that with just my eyes. And it feels very genuine also to do that to the viewer because the viewer, that's all the information they have is what I put on the paper. They don't get the whole backstory. They weren't in the studio with the model, you know? So it feels like a very direct connection to me. Mm -hmm. And um, when I choose faces, when I look on that app and I choose someone to draw, I'm really looking for someone who feels very genuine and true. And that's probably the biggest thing I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who feels authentic. Like they're not posing too hard. They're not trying too hard. They're just being who they are. Um, at least that's the impression I get. So those are the ones I kind of find myself gravitating to the most. It's a really pure, a pure essence about them. And then sometimes I find that I choose faces or expressions that are what I would like to feel today. So you know, you know, if, you know, in the pandemic, you know, like these faces with these huge smiles and laughing. It was like, yes, like joy. Let's have some joy in here today. You know, have you ever considered doing custom portraits? Like when somebody would order their own face or face of their family member? Yes, I do do commissions. I do commission work of pets and people. Um, and all of my knitting uh, knit portrait art series, except for the knit tapestries and the knit animations, but the knit prints and then the knit artwork like that one. Um, I do do commissions of those. Um, even with those though, I have not met the sitter for any of those. I obviously am talking with the family member who's commissioning the piece, but not the, the actual person. Have you ever had difficulty like getting the likeness and like showing the character of the person in your drawing? Um, yeah, you learn that over time. There's different tips and tricks you can use to help make that happen. So some things that I find are really useful are, um, oddly enough, the hairline. You know, getting that hairline just so in the face shape is really key to getting a likeness. Um, just being really solid on all of the uh, proportions and the measurements of the face are key. Um, some other things are your hard and soft edges, right? To make sure that like, you know, 
if the smile is moving, they are caught mid laugh, you know, I'm not going to put a bunch of really hard lines in there because it's moving. People move. We're rarely just static and still. So the lines should be a little blurry because they're moving, you know, those sorts of things. Well, I mean, it's a d- more difficult to achieve this knitting yeah. because you're adding another layer of difficulty to that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and definitely when I start a new series that incorporates the knitting, there are some that, you know, are flops, right? I have to kind of find like, okay, well, like, which, and, and there are some portraits that I draw that are better suited towards being knitted up than others, you know? Um, so those are all things I have to kind of keep into consideration. Yeah. Cause yeah, I'll definitely do a few, a few rounds. And if I'm like, okay, I'm enjoying, or I appreciate, and I like more of the pieces I'm creating for this series than the ones that I don't like for this series. And I can kind of learn as I go, which ones are working better. I mean, is there ever a complete disaster? disaster yes yes <laughs> there are complete disasters um I actually had a piece recently I did um I have a sponsorship right now with Universal Yarn so um they shipped me yarn I was making a project with them it was going to be a knit tapestry and you know my machine just was like not working for me and so I got started and I started working on it and it just was a complete disaster. I was bending up my needles. And so like an artist, I pivoted and I switched it up. Um, I've been wanting to do some glitched animations. So I wanted to do portraits that kind of glitch out and sort of play with that idea of technology a little bit more. And so I turned it into, I used the, the yarn because it was such beautiful, soft yarn. I was like, oh, I'm so excited. I still want to, like, I want to use it and like make this this new project, which is a long, basically a really long 30 foot long uh, by like 20 inches, 30 feet by 20 inches film strip of this portrait. And then I I glitched it out before I knit it. So it already glitches. And then I over, I went ahead and duplicate stitched even more glitches into it. Um, and then it's the idea that is it can be exhibited as one long piece of knit fabric but if you actually photographed every one of them, you would see the glitching moving through the piece. Right. Okay, so like when you mentioned how you learned how to knit, yeah. you said there was no yeah. YouTube oh. back then. How how did you learn all the animation and all the glitching and all of that good stuff? What was your learning process? Um, yeah, so it's been interesting <laughs> because these machines are very old. And I'm getting them all secondhand um, or they're, they've been given to me and they sometimes come with a manual. Sometimes they don't come with the manual. There is some information about these machines on YouTube, but not always for the model you have. So you kind of have to piece it together. And, you know, especially like this one, this one from the eighties that is connected to a computer. So there's I have to learn the software. I have to learn the color changer. It has a ribber. I'm doing with these knit tapestries. It's double bed jacquard with six colors doing a face. It's not really what the machine was ever built to do. Mm -hmm. It was built to do a repeating pattern like we would normally see. Um, So it was a lot of, I had to read the manual. I had to watch videos. I had to go through different like blog things to see what was going to work. Um, yeah, I basically was cross-referencing about seven different sources to figure out how to make one of those tapestries. It was a lot. <laughs> um, but what's beautiful about these machines, though, that I love is because I get them secondhand, um, they usually get shipped to me. As they just ship me everything that was in that person's collection because whoever is getting rid of it doesn't really know what it is and they don't really know how to use it. And so they're just like, I don't know. And they just throw all the knitting stuff together and ship it to me. And sometimes it's missing pieces or whatever, but that's not, that hasn't been a big deal. But what has been beautiful is like all the old notebooks from the previous owner and seeing like, so sometimes I look through those and I have like find clues in there as to how to use the machine from just their old letters and notes about like how to use it and like their little sample swatches and everything. It's so cool. Well, what's your ambition for the future? Like, where do you see yourself going with this? I 
I don't know if I really know. All I know is I'm going to be forever doing this. This is what I'm doing for the rest of my life, you know, and I'm not done combining knitting with drawing and I'm not done with portraits. You know, sometimes I think, oh, maybe I should try landscapes. And then I try drawing it. I'm like, so like bored. It's just, it's not for me. I love faces. I love people. And there are so many faces in the world. So many people I haven't met yet that <laughs> um, I just feel like there's an endless source of wonderful, amazing faces that I want to spend time with. So I definitely want to do more of the tapestries and more of the glitched out pieces um, and incorporate more of the technology. Um, I might do some more things with stencil and 3D printing because I've incorporated that a little bit too. So I might be throwing some of that in. Um, I'm really inspired by graffiti and street art. So I've done some graffiti showcases and things before and worked in that medium as well. So I'm always interested in how I can incorporate that into the pieces that I'm making. Um, so yeah, so there's a few different avenues I want to go down. Well, when you think about future, do you think in terms of collections? Like, do you immediately think, okay, the next collection is going to be that? Like, do you think big or do you think about the next portrait? I, it changes. I mean, I usually think of the next portrait, you know, you know and I kind of, I've learned over the years as an artist, I have to go with my gut. And if I'm really inspired to do something, I need to let myself do it. So I mean, that's how I even got started with the knitting machine was I was like, I really want to learn how to use this tool. But it meant that I had to stop doing the artwork that was getting a lot of attention. And I had to put it on the back burner and really figure out how to use this machine. And so I often have to do that. I have to take a pause. But I've learned like it was so worth it. It's so paid off because it really helped inspire and made some of my future work really possible. So I try to, I give my, it's, it's hard sometimes because sometimes I'll stop myself and be like, no, 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 you have to work on the thing. And I'm like, no, remember, remember it's worked out well for you in the past to like embrace it, embrace the inspiration and sort of ride with the wave. And that usually results in a series happening because I need to test it a few times to see if it works, you know, or if, if I like it or not. So I usually do at least like five, six pieces you know, in that style. And then I kind of see like, oh yeah, I like I like how this is turning out. Well, when I'm thinking about an artist, any kind of artist, right? It's sort of, there's no, it's inspiration. It's like whatever came to your mind. There's no business selling, making money, paying bills kind of thinking that goes along with that. How do you balance it? How do you balance for yourself? Like what's going to sell? What's not going to sell? What piques your interest? What pulls your soul kind of thing? Like how do you balance the business and the art? Um, as far as uh, having a goal to sell. Um, you know, I have been very fortunate that I, I do what I'm inspired to do. And the support has come along. Um, so I'm really lucky that way. Um, it's not significant, but it's enough. And I'm sort of in it for the long game. So for me, it's not about, oh, I want to make a lot of money now. It's about, no, I want to make the art that I want to make and I want to get it out there. And, you know, we'll, we'll work through that as we go. Um, as far as just balancing life and business, because I am a full-time artist, this is my studio and, you know, that's always a challenge too. I'm always playing with different techniques of like work on the business stuff in the morning and then spend the afternoon more relaxed working on the artwork um, and sort of finding the the sweet spot of how I can get all the work done. And then also my passion for both drawing and knitting is also a thing that happens to me a lot because, you know, I recently started a new shawl project because I was like, oh, I'm like itching to knit and I haven't knitted in like, three months I've been knitting but like I haven't been hand knitting you know what I mean so it was different so you know I had been knitting every single day but I really wanted to like sit down in a chair and like hand it something you know and then I get the same itch with drawing if I'm at the machine so long I'm like oh I just need to sit down I need to draw it's like water on a hot day like I just need to like and then when I do sit down it's like gulping water I'm like ah oh, draw 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 and then three drawings in one day you know I just like, I'm very passionate about these things. I mean, they are just a key component of who, who I am. 
Well, when people talk about uh, machine eating, there is always, I mean, not always, but uh, often there's like almost snobbish sort of attitude that this is not the real knitting, like right. the hand knitting versus the machine knitting. The, like, you know, there's always this discussion going on. What's your feeling? What's where do you stand with this? You know, I, maybe it's because I come from an art background. So one of the galleries I worked at out of art school uh, was a glass gallery and we represented Del Chihuly. And Dal Chihuly makes these beautiful glass pieces, They're often in botanical gardens or in hotels, they're big chandeliers. Um, and so there were some discussion about him because he doesn't actually make the pieces because he had an injury to his eye. And so it's not really safe for him to be working in the hot shop. And, but obviously we all recognize, well, he's the artist, of course, you know, he just has other people doing things. Um, and that's sort of how I see it. They're, it's just a tool. I'm the one making the decisions about the color of the yarn and the image. And I draw the images even. So like they're coming all the way from drawing into the knitting pattern, everything. So yeah, the, the knitting machines don't do the work for you. <laughs> um, you definitely are working in a flow with them and they will make your work faster and they will make the stitches more precise. So that's why I even got started with the knitting machine because to make a knit animation, I not only needed to knit faster, but I also needed some more consistency in my stitches so that it wouldn't jump around too much in the animation. Um, so it will help in those respects, but yeah, it's not gonna do all the work for you. If you could take like a year off from your life, like just let it stand still, right? And work on some dream project. Like, do you have that dream project in mind? Hmm. That's a really good question. <laughs> no, I I recently had that experience where um, I received a grant. I wanted to do a really long knit animation. Um, but in order for me to sort of block out that amount of time to work on just one project, I needed it funded and I needed a lot of yarn and I needed to make sure I could put everything else I was working on on hold for years so that I had no like workshops, no artist talks, no like other projects, just the one because it was such a big undertaking. Um, so I was lucky that I got a grant to fund it and I worked on that through most of 2021. And um, yeah, and so it was a really cool experience being able to focus on peace. It was a it was actually on exhibit at Fiber Art International this past summer. Um, and now it's on exhibit at the Museum of Art in Fort Collins. So mm -hmm. you can actually go see the piece. It's on exhibit. But it features um, over 200 knit faces. Uh, and they're like formatted side by side. So this was post pan, you know, lockdown, sort of reminiscent of like Zoom calls where we have our faces side by side. And the faces were all women taken from old family films, sort of spanning between the 40s and the 70s. And so it was about sort of conversation and learning and our um, connection through time and tech. Um, and then there's white yarn that connected every single face because something else that really um, inspires me with knitting and why I included in my artwork is not only for all those amazing words that I heard all those viewers say um, and and what we wear, but also like, I'm really interested in the idea that in tech science, textile science, they like love knitting because it's a continuous flow of fiber. It never knots, right. it doesn't crisscross, it flows, which I think is really interesting about how we as people flow and are connected. Um, so I think that is really fascinating. And then also knitting as a binary code and how that relates to technology. You know, it's just pearls and knits, that's it. So it's very much a binary code and very scientific that way. And I have a real soft spot. And as you can tell, technology appears a lot in the work that I do um, because I have metal implants in my heart and along my spine. Um, I got those when I was a, a kid. So I'm here living my best life because of science and technology and mechanics. And so I, feel like, you know, technology isn't the enemy. You know, I think it's it's a collaborator, which is another reason why I love the machines because we're collaborators here. We can work together. They can be a helpful tool to help me get to the places I want to be. 
Um, so I like to incorporate technology in the work that I do a lot. So that's why the glitching, that's why, you know, the animations, and that's why the machines just make sense. Well, when you were mentioning to me that it was difficult to find information when you were like growing up and trying to learn something and there was no YouTube and now there is YouTube and there is multiple information out there. Is there information on what you do? Do you like to teach? Do you see yourself as a person who brings this knowledge to the world? Um, yeah, I'm happy to do so. It was really, you know, lovely to be at like the library and I created a series of videos for their patrons to use. Um, so that ended December last year. And so while I was there, I created a bunch of videos teaching people how to use those knitting machines. Um, and since then, many people have come into the library and use those machines. And it just warms my heart, makes me so happy because they're making their own projects. They're doing their own experiments and doing their own things. And it's so cool to see some new life brought to these old machines because they're they're fantastic. They can do so many things. So is there like a book deal or something that you see yourself doing? I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I will be featured in a book at some point next year. So that'll be on co like coming up. But um, I, that's just my artwork. So I don't know. That would be interesting. <laughs> What's your relationship with social media? Um, As in like which platforms I'm on? No, like what do you find on it? Like is that people, do you meet people? Do people inspire you? you do you find faces there? Or is it like necessary part of business it's a little bit of both one I love connecting with people and hearing about you know what they see or think of my artwork that makes me really happy it's nice to get that feedback that's really good um even if it's anonymous or negative it's still cool to hear the discussions um yeah because recently I had a piece shared on Twitter somebody had shared my work and the discussion was like, oh, wait, but that's like a photo of the knitting. And they're like, no, go to her website. It explains she actually knits it. And like just seeing how they talked about it helps me understand how I need to clarify my message better or not. You know, it just helps me understand how people are reading it, which is nice. Because um, sometimes if you're standing right there in a gallery, you don't get as honest feedback. So it's really cool. So I really appreciate that. Um, it's helped me grow my artwork and my art style. So when I started to draw one thing I would do as sort of an exercise, and I wouldn't recommend it to every artist because you really have to be approaching it in the right mindset, <clears throat> is I would post my artwork, my drawing that I'd done um, on a platform where there's lots of artwork being shared. And then I'd check back later in the day to see if I could find my piece. And if I couldn't find my piece, to me, that was a problem. Like my piece needs to, be, I need to have a unique voice. I need to be saying something different. And if it's not different, if it's not like, standing out to me who made it, then I'm clearly not being clear enough. So that was an exercise I did to help me sort of even find my technique and my like unique style and drawing to make sure it's different. It's standing out. It's not just getting lost in the muddle. Well, when you think about yourself as an artist, are you satisfied with where you are? Like, are you ever hard on yourself? Do you doubt yourself? Oh, totally. Yes. It's, it's, especially because, you know, as artists, you know, I work alone in the studio with my dogs. So it's like, when I'm here for a long time trying new things and I'm like, I don't know if this is crazy to do this or if it's genius, I have no idea. You know, you just kind of work in this isolated bubble, which is really nice about social media is then you can kind of share it and then be like outside yourself in your own head for a minute. Um, sometimes I'll post things around the room that like make me feel like, Right. Like other people are looking at the work. It's like, I'm not just working in isolation here. It is being shared and people are seeing it. And I have to kind of remind myself um, because yeah, as an artist, you can be really hard on yourself. And as far as inspiration goes, um, you know, back when I worked in the galleries and the community arts organizations, I loved working with artists because I felt like all these artists just can't live long enough. You know, they come in and they talk about all these things they want to make and they want to do. And they're just like, I want to do this and I want to try this. And, I want, and I'm like, I know, I hear you. Like, they just honestly can't live a long enough life for all the things that they want to do. Um, and that's sort of how I feel with my art making is, you know, I'll be like, oh, that looks cool. I really want to incorporate that with that and like mix them together and see what happens. And yeah, 
you're just do you, do you feel the same way about your knitting that you don't have enough lifetime for you to try to knit everything you want to try yes yes <laughs> yes all the hand knitting and all the projects I know there are so many things that I want to knit yeah there is just not enough time the list keeps growing <laughs> are I you a, are you a monogamous knitter when it comes to hand knitted stuff yes yes I always have my sock knitting always because that's what I do and then I have a project that challenges me on some level um, or that I just feel like looks really cool and I really want it. Um, and then I work on that one project. I don't like too many whips sitting around. It kind of kind of drives me nuts. So <laughs> and then I have to I have to make a decision on it. Like, am I going to frog it or get rid of it? Like, what am I going to do here? How do your family and like close friends react to the fact that you combined your painting this knitting like were they surprised I don't yeah I mean I don't think they really understood what I was going for initially until I started making them and then they were really supportive and very excited um I'm in a household with really creative people my husband also has an art degree so he is extremely supportive of the work that I'm producing um and my kids are also very creative and so yeah, they've been very supportive when I'm like, I'm going to make knit animation that glitches. And they're like, okay. <laughs> Have you ever knitted them? Oh, like made a picture of them? No, I haven't. <laughs> I've drawn them before, but I haven't done a finished piece of them or just like a sketch of them. So another idea. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, it gets back to that thing like, ah, but I know so much about them. <laughs> Well, do you think it makes it more difficult for you to know people, a person that you would then portray and meet? Like, is it harder? I think it does make it a little harder because, you know, then I, I try to think about like, well, how am I going to communicate? Like, I want to communicate to the viewer and I want, I love that. How, how do I describe it? It's an issue of discovery. Like, I think I just love meeting new faces and new people. So it's kind of like, that's more fun for me. Whereas if I have to like take like someone I know really well and try to take everything I know about them and then put it into a piece and explain that to somebody else, it, I don't know. I feel like it would be, yeah, probably harder and probably overwhelming because it would be so much that I would want to say. <laughs> well, plus it's harder to pick that one image because oh, it's so like thousands of pictures like that doesn't really look like them or no that's not a genuine smile for them like I know their smile <laughs> well I love meeting you and I love hearing about your creative process and I you know can't wait to see what else you're gonna create in the future so thank you so very much for being my guest today and chatting with me oh thank you so much for having me that was really fun thank you